Well, thank you for having me here this morning. I uh, have to say that Concordia looks good. Um, we've been in the area before. We used to be down at Southern Cloud. Uh, my wife and I taught in Southern Cloud Music uh, in uh, Miltonville in Glasgow. And so Concordia was one of our stops when we wanted to go someplace real. So um, <laughs> we come into town, and, and there's so many new buildings and things, and everything's shaping up. I mean, it looks good. Um, <clears throat> I, I, there's a there's a pharmacy there that used to be like uh, it was Hardee's, wasn't it Hardee's? And then like uh, Carl's Jr. or something. And now it's a pharmacy, so you know things change, don't they? Um, anyway, it's good to be here today, and uh, what a great day! This is Pentecost Sunday. Um, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. At our church, this is a special uh, day because when we got locked down for COVID, uh, we decided we had. Uh, home groups, we met in home groups for a while, and then we finally decided, well, when are we ever going to come back together? Pentecost was the day we came back together, because they were all in one place, and they, they, so we said, that's it, we're coming back on Pentecost. I don't know about you guys, but that's how it happened for us. And so um, I want to focus on <clears throat> this verse for just a second, that we've been talking about at our church, to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. And Jesus is coming back, right? Amen? So the more we, see, the more we know that, the more we need to get together and not neglect meeting together as some do. I've always thought for years, this is a passage about, you're supposed to go to church. Um, actually, uh, that's a given. But what it says here is, we're supposed to stir one another up to love and good deeds and encourage one another while we're here. So I hope that the, you're doing that today. We're not just in the building together. It's not enough just to come and show up and be here. But we want to encourage one another and spur one another on. Uh, Parasmus towards love and good deeds, right? Uh, and so my encouragement, I, my hope is that I'm doing that for you today and that that will do that for each other. So um, you've seen the video. That probably says uh, a whole bunch that I could, it take me a long time to say about dinner church. Uh, but I do want to uh, let you know that uh, it has grown. We've got four locations in Hutchinson where we serve dinners in, in Hutchinson on a regular basis. We've got one in Wichita, and we have one that we just started with you guys in Salina. Oh, man, it's really great to be working with you guys and with Hall Wesleyan Church. Um, to me, it feels like um, we have a Wesleyan presence in Salina again. This feels really good to be there. So um, for me to, to tell you what Dinner Church is, I, I have to say, we put the noun and, and the adjective in the right order here on purpose. Dinner, church, the emphasis on church. So let me give you a picture of what we've done in the past. This might illustrate it a little bit better. We took a bus, transit bus, took everything out of it, cleaned it out, redid the floor, did the walls. We put pews. Uh, we got rid of our pews and did short pews and put them on both sides and the little cranky thing you do up on the uh, roof. We put in a skylight with a, a stained glass window because the church has got to have stained glass window, right? And, and so we took it out to the car show, and uh, we were having uh, chapel uh, services in our mobile chapel at the car show at the mall. And uh, we also, here's another picture, we took it out to the uh, Oktoberfest and, uh, in Nickerson, and uh, people came in the front door, they went out the back door, we gave them popcorn, uh, candy, and hot chocolate on the way through. And so we were using this mobile chapel and then COVID hit, and nobody wanted to be in a bus together. So that went by the wayside. Anyway, we called this the bus church. It's the bus church. Did you notice? Bus church. Because the church bus takes you to church, but the bus church takes the church to you, right? The emphasis on church. So we were doing bus church for a while, and, and then now we, we came across the idea of doing dinner church together. Well, let's take a look at this. It's specifically not a feed, not a potluck, or a soup kitchen. It's not a church dinner. It's a dinner church. That's what it is specifically. And so as we were coming out of COVID, or going into COVID, we had to ask ourselves a question. What are the essentials? Um, people were talking about what is essential. Is the church essential? We were like, absolutely, the church is absolutely essential. Um, but what does that mean? We were really loud about we're essential, but we didn't know why are we essential. What are the essentials about church? Now, 
I hope that you are ready and willing to be participatory today because I want you to participate in this. We're going to have a little discussion and I want to know what do you see are the essential basics that you have to have to have a church. Let's, let's take a look at this big words right quick. Minimal ecclesiology, which basically means the, the very minimum, but it's the study of the church, ecclesia. So what is it? I mean, translation, what does it take to have church? What does it take to have church? What do you think? Give me some ideas. What, do you, what does it take to have church? What do you have to have to have church? The Word. I heard that a lot of places. Absolutely. We've got to have the Word proclaimed. Um, uh, the, if, we, if we told you you have to do church at home tomorrow, what would you do? What's essential? You would read the Word. What else? Sing, worship, those two go together, right? Not always. Not all worship is singing, right? Singing is part of worship, but there's, we need to do worship. We've got to have the Word. We've got to have worship. What else? Prayer. We've got to pray. What else? People. Yeah, fellowship. We've got to have fellowship. In fact, uh, the church is the people, right? It's not the building. It's the people. And uh, so we understand that. What else? Anything else you can think of? Communion, okay, we need to break bread together, okay, can I, can I stretch a little bit? Um, we break bread and eat and drink together, right? And historically, it hasn't always been a piece of cracker and a juice, right? Keep that thought in mind. What else? Okay, well, that's, good. that's a good start. That's a good start. And yeah, the essentials don't have to be a big, long list because they are the essentials, right? Just a few things. Let me encourage you that it doesn't... As long as you have the essentials, you don't have to have... Well, let me ask you a question. Do you have to have pews? I sure hope not, because you guys got rid of yours. Right? You know, those were kind of little... Uh, I don't know if you call them tropes or whatever they were. We were trying to say, hey, this is a chapel, so what's got to be in a chapel? You've got to have pews. You've got to have stained glass. I mean, you know, the whole idea is just we need, to have, we need to be together, and we need to do these essentials together to have church. So... <clears throat> This next picture, you may have seen it in the video. I love this one right here. This is from our uh, dinner church at Good Sam. And <clears throat> this is Joni Finkenbinder. And uh, she's there, and we're just around tables. I've never seen her do this in church church. Okay? But at dinner church, um, there was a moment of worship that she just decided, i got to grab somebody's hand and say, praise the Lord, you know? <laughs> just spontaneous praise of the Lord that happens. Uh, there's things that happen around tables that breaks down barriers and, and causes us to not be, well, I, what word am I looking for? We're not so stiff when we're around tables, right? I mean, it's, it's a little bit different atmosphere, a little bit more uh, uh, open. Uh, let's take a look at the scripture right quick. And this, already this morning, I'm talking about how much time do I have. We, I didn't think I was a long, a long preacher, but man, we really went this morning. Um, and I try not to now. So I'm not going to be very long on Zacchaeus. That's my, I'm telling myself, keep it short. Keep it short. I'll read it to you, and I want to give you a few insights. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when he, they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and I have defrauded, if I have defrauded anyone, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham, and the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Now, I want to work it backwards. Jesus came to seek the lost. He came to seek them out, to go where they're at. And it says, today salvation has come to Zacchaeus' house. And do you know that son of, son of Abraham, actually it says, those who have faith like Abraham. It was, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And those that believe and have faith like that are sons of Abraham. Now, Zacchaeus may have been uh, born into the family of Abraham, but now he is a son of Abraham. So there's kind of a double meaning there. There. Um, Notice that they got upset. What were they upset about? They were upset that this man named Jesus went and ate the house of a sinner. 
He went and spent time with sinners. In fact, this was a, a common theme for Jesus. They really got upset at him for spending time with sinners and tax collectors and, and eating with those people. Zacchaeus received him joyfully. I love that. He received Jesus joyfully. In this also, Jesus did not say, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm taking you to church. He said, Zacchaeus, come down. I'm going to your house today. To your, at your house is going to find salvation. At your house, church is coming to your house today. Jesus is coming to your house. This is what happened here. So let's go on. The big table is called the big table. It's a community dinner and a Jesus story. And we're straight up about that. It is those things. It's the big table, and I'm going to talk about why we call it the big table. Um, it is a community dinner because we want everybody to feel welcome there. We think at the big table, there's room for everybody. Everybody's welcome. There's room for everybody. And then also the Jesus story because we don't want to bait and switch people. We're right up front going to tell you, hey, we're going to, keep a, we're going to do a Jesus story. A lot of times we say, hey, you don't have to stay for the Jesus story, but it seems like everybody stays for the Jesus. Maybe it's because we, we give the cookies out after the Jesus story. Maybe, maybe that's why. Maybe that's why they stay. I don't know. Anyway, uh, we call it the big table. And so we call it the big table because some of these statistics, we, we want to we reach out to as many people as we possibly can. And I'm going to go through a little bit of some demographics and stuff right quick just to show a perspective of things as it relates to church these days. Do you know that Kansas is not the most populated, uh, not the most well-attended of church uh, in the United States. You'll see some states there that are dark, like Nebraska, and some of those have a higher percentage of people that actually attend church. I'm surprised to see that Kansas is between 20 and 22 percent people attend church in Kansas. That's pretty sad because there's like 80 percent of people don't go anywhere. This is this is these are, and and this is this is all this is pre-COVID stuff. So I mean, it's probably worse, but. Um, you notice as you go out to the coast, it thins out. It thins out to California and up there to the northeast, and it makes its way down to 0 to 12% of people. 90% of people on the coast are not going to church anywhere. That means we got a lot of people we can reach, right? We can reach a lot of people. Now, how are we going to do that? Let's take a look at this, this next. This is generalized. This doesn't work for Concordia. I get it. doesn't work for Hutchinson that much either. But this is uh, nationwide. They say that in American cities, uh, usually there's about 16,000 residents. Um, I have actually done some Mission Insight stuff here that's really interesting. Uh, some statistics and things, about uh, 5,000 that are in uh, Concordia as far as population. And it tells what kind of people here and what kind of uh, lives they live and that kind of thing. Um, one of the things I thought was really interesting, um, and I think we have this in common with you, is that when it comes to education level, by the way, congratulations to all those graduates. Man, what a great list of graduates were up there this morning, huh? We, uh, it says high school graduates in Concordia is uh, about 5% higher than the state of Kansas as far as high school graduates. Way to go. Good job. When it comes to some college, they're actually still 2% uh, two, two higher than the rest of Kansas as far as having some college. And then uh, it's almost twice as many people as the Kansas average have an associate's degree, at least. And that makes sense, doesn't it, because of, Can uh, because of a Cloud County Community College over here. Well, we're kind of like you with Hutchinson Community College. We have a community college in our area as well. And then when it comes to bachelors and grads, it's not as high. But that also makes sense because there's a community college. So um, I'm going to leave some of these statistics about Salina and Concordia. Uh, with Pastor David, so he can look those over. But very interesting insights inside there about the people. Let's go back to the statistics we have up here. Probably have to take it by a third to make some of this work. And I don't know that this is even uh, correct for you guys. You test it and see what you think. Uh, are there about 70, 80, 70 to 80 people in a neighborhood? Mm, I don't think so. Probably not. We're Kansas. We're spread out. We, we, don't, we don't, except for Kansas City. Kansas City is probably 70, 80 people in a neighborhood. In case you didn't know, I grew up in Kansas City. I've been in Kansas City. I went to Washburn University in Topeka. And after there, we came down here to Miltonville, Glasgow, uh, to teach in Southern Cloud for a few years music. 
And then we got call, I got called in the ministry, and we went out to uh, uh, Syracuse, Kansas for a while. And then now we're in Hutchinson, Kansas. So we've been in western, central, and eastern Kansas. We've been in the largest, and we've been in the smallest. So we get it. But uh, Concordia is kind of normal. I'd say this is normal. This is like, this is like the normals right here. Okay. Um, these statistics say that uh, maybe 20 neighborhoods... If you took a third of that, maybe there's 20 different neighborhoods, and you can, you can test that out yourself and see. But what we see is usually there's about one-third of the neighborhoods are sore neighborhoods, which means there are needs there, and people know they have needs. There's sore neighborhoods that are hurting and in need. And so those sore neighborhoods are, are a, a really... By the way, I didn't say this the first service, but you know where we plant our churches? Most of the time we put our churches in the affluent neighborhoods, not in the poor neighborhoods. I mean, these, these third neighborhoods that we say are no, neighborhoods are not usually the ones where we find our church buildings. And so, um, and, and also there, there, there may be people there that can't uh, transport to the place where those churches that we build are. So there's a mission field right there in our backyard. This is the one that surprised me as I think 18 churches in a, in a town that size. I mean, how many, I guess I'm not going to put you on the spot, I'll just say, in Hutchinson, we've got 95 churches in Hutchinson. So it's like, it's, it seems crazy, right? And I know in smaller places, it seems like the smaller you get, that's like, how many churches do we have in town? We've got so many churches in town. Um, but there's still a lot of people to reach. Still a lot of people to reach. And I'll, and I'll give you one more statistic that's just going to be very surprising, I hope. Of all those people, those 80% that may not be going to church somewhere, one-third of them are open to the possibility of going to a traditional or a proclamation church like we're sitting in right now. That means one-third of those people are, are, are open to coming to your church here and to being a part of this. And you've got a great work ahead of you to continue to do that. Um, I don't like to talk bad about one thing in order to increase another thing. Um, our church at Hutchinson Wesleyan Church is still reaching people even though we're doing dinner church. It's a, it's a connection relationship between the two, deep roots and wild branches, we call it, that we have deep roots in the church, but the deep roots need fresh expressions out there uh, to have life and vibrancy. And so also those uh, branches, if you cut the branches off, they die. They've got to have connection with something stable and solid. And so it's a great combination to have a church like yours reaching out with a fresh expression like you're doing now in Salina with the dinner churches. They go hand in hand. And so um, what I see here is there's a contextual church where some people would come uh, if it's an incarnational kind of a ministry. And dinner church, you could reach a third of the people with dinner church that you wouldn't with others. My illustration is this. It's great to fish at the pond shoulder to shoulder with people while you're catching fish. And you'll catch some fish. But what if I told you, you could go down the road and there's a pond where nobody's fishing and they stocked it yesterday. To me, I'm thinking, I want to go there. I want to go there and see how they're biting over there because there's a great opportunity and not many people, not many churches are trying to reach into that place. And so that's, that's where we are at with dinner church. And, and I, I, here's another thing I didn't say this morning. And I'll just say this honestly, we could start more dinner churches than I have energy to do. That's just, that's just a flat-out fact. We, we, I have five more locations in Hutchinson that we could start one in the next week. It, people are hungry, literally hungry, but hungry for the gospel in a way that's different. And so I just want to tell you that there's a great need out there. You don't want to pray for workers to go out in the harvest field in a situation like that. Now, I'm moving on quick because I want to get to stories. You probably want to hear stories. I want to tell stories of things that are happening. So here's one story. Um, this is at uh, Park Villa. It's uh, Riverside Park in the middle of Wichita. And uh, so you may know, uh, you already saw Philip. Philip is sitting at the table with the glasses. He's, uh, he grew up in Australia. And uh, he is a professor at Friends University. And he comes to the big table and he lives in that neighborhood, Riverside neighborhood, and he's inviting all his neighbors. We're pulling all his neighbors in. Um, there's one, there's one, and interestingly, there's one place down there that I've tried. I thought, man, that's, 
That's a unique situation. It's called the Monica House. And the Monica House is kind of a creative expression of music and poetry and art and all kinds of expressions and things. And, and I've, I've knocked on the door and tried to get somebody to give them a flyer, say, hey, why don't you come down the street and come to the dinner church? Maybe you'd like it there. And uh, I never have had any uh, way to reach into the Monica House. So this, ta- this picture is taken after we have been eating and, and now uh, notice that there is a, a person sitting out on a bench outside uh, in the park, just outside of our building. So I go out and I talk to him and I say, hey, you want to come in and have a meal? We're, we're eating tonight. Why don't you come on and have some spaghetti? And, and he says, yeah, I'd like to do that. I'll be in in just a minute. And it took him a long time to get in. But then he came in and his shoes were untied. And, and it was like, uh, he says, I, I can't seem to tie my shoes. Can you help me? And, and he showed me his hands. And then one of his hands had all these open sores on it. And so he was having an issue. And he could only use one. He was trying to tie his shoes with one hand. And so I said, here, sit down. So I'm tying his shoes. This, this was a really unique feeling for me because here he is sitting at the table, and I'm kneeling down tying his shoes. I feel like, it feels like I'm washing feet or something, you know? And so I'm tying his shoes for him because he couldn't tie his own shoes. And we said, here, let's get you some spaghetti. And, and uh, he tried to eat the spaghetti. He can't with one hand. It's not working out so good. So he said, hey, why don't we just get you some uh, spaghetti meat and a spoon? And he says, that sounds great. So we did why are you here anyway? And he says, well, I got to go soon because I'm going to the hospital. What? Well, I mean, obviously his hand looks bad. He's going to the hospital and somebody's going to pick him up. He's waiting for a ride to the hospital. So uh, we are eating and, and, and talking with him. And the next thing we know, somebody walks in the door. He's sitting right between. Oh, he said, did I tell you his name is Cain? I can't remember from one service to another. This is horrible preaching twice. His name's Cain. He says, yeah, like in the Bible. So, yeah, Cain is right there, and Philip. And between Cain and Philip comes in Jared. And Jared comes in and sits down, and we're, we're kind of like, who's this guy? Who's Jared? He just walked in the middle of everything. Philip knows him. He's talked to him before. And then we get to talking and find out he runs Monica House. So he shows up at the big table. Why did he show up at the big table? Not because I gave him a flyer, because I couldn't. But the reason he was there is he just Cain's ride to the hospital. He saw Cain in the park and he says, man, you're in bad shape. We got to take you to the hospital. So Cain was waiting for Jared to take him to the hospital. Cain's eating with us. Jared shows up and says, where's Cain? I want to take care of him. And he finds us taking care of Cain. Now, I don't know about Jared. He's not a churchgoer. This this situation, uh, I, I see him kind of like a good Samaritan type, okay? He's taking care of a person in need, and he's on this mission doing this kind of work, and he comes across us doing this similar kind of work of taking care of these people that are in need, the lower third, right? Uh, the, the lost, the left out, uh, the, those kind of people. He, he, is, he sees that, and he, he's like, he's down with that. He's, he's like, yeah, this is this, you, you guys are like right in there. This is what we need to do. And, and so, there's kind of a, a, a shared mission, right? And, and we understand this. So that there are people out there that want to do the kind of work, I think, that Jesus does, right? They just need to do it maybe in a different way. We should move on. Where do we get the idea? It's not new. This is not a brand new idea. This is a reclam- reclamation project of an ancient practice. So let's go to church history. This is church history in condensed form. This is like uh, Cliff's Notes, like crazy, okay? This is condensed down. Um, we've got uh, Jesus, and then we've got the early church, and that's the apostolic church. And for 300 years, they met around tables and ate and broke bread together and talked about Jesus and did all of this. And then Constantine says, hey, I want to make uh, Christianity the church, uh, the state church. And then they got robes, and they made buildings, and they, they had cathedrals and all this stuff. And it's like, uh, we don't like all this table stuff with those poor people. Okay, now that, I want to say there's, there's not anything bad with cathedrals, right? It shows forth the grandness of God. And people learned from the stained glass windows the story of Jesus. It's another way. And it's a grand way, but it's different, Right? And then we go from there, we have the Reformation. I think you know about the Reformation. 
and, and the break off, and, and in that we also have the printing press, and we've got the Bible in our hands. Amazing. Now people don't know what to do with the Bible because somebody has always shown them the stained glass windows and told them up front, sometimes in a language they could understand, what the Bible means. And so now they have to be the priest of their own home. And so the Reformation type church would say, now let's, let's get somebody that can teach this, somebody that knows it, and not, just, not to just tell it to you, but to have you sit in rows and, and come and learn how to use the Bible, learn what this is all about. And so it's kind of a school setting, kind of like seminary, okay? And so we have Reformation era, which is a whole kind of like church is a seminary for people to learn. Very good. Different, though, right? It's different. We're coming back around, not because we want to say these things are bad and we don't ever want to do those things again. We're coming back around because we think there's something missing from the table. Anybody miss the family table these days? I mean, I mean, honestly, stop and think about that. We, we've, got, we've got a crisis of not eating together, just as families, right? And, and this, is a, this is a way everybody's got to eat. I mean, do you have time for church? Well, maybe. You've got to eat. Come on. <laughs> Let's eat and have church. So... Um, one of the things I like to say sometimes is that um, these days, you're not sure when you're going to church what it's going to be like. You don't know what you're supposed to wear. And you guys do a great job of telling people ahead of time what it's going to be like. But um, some people, you go places you go, are like, I don't know, am I supposed to dress up? Am I supposed to wear a tie? What am I supposed to do? And uh, some people don't know how to go to church today. But everybody knows how to eat. Everybody knows how to eat, right? Come to dinner. All right, let's move on. Things change. Methods may change, but the message does not. This is an important one right here. The message never changes. The gospel is the gospel. We don't want to change the gospel, but we may go with a different message, uh, with a different method. The gospel, good news, can be planted in various situations. It can be in all kinds of conditions. And guess what? Conditions have changed. <laughs> we live in a world that's between conditions. We have one foot in the old church world, and we have one foot in a new world called Fresh Expressions. And I would love to see both grow hand in hand at the same time. All right, let's move on. I'm taking a breath because I feel like I'm packing it in, man. All right, this is another brief, brief, condensed version. This is the American church, okay? This is an overview of the American church. By the way, these things recycle themselves. So you may see them recycle. Started out, we have a parish church where you're over the entire, the whole town has one church. they all one faith, all one uh, denomination together, right? Then Brush Arbor, that's kind of a revival type thing. It's kind of like tent meeting. The, the resurgence of that would be like uh, Billy Graham Crusades, right? Go out, we can have tent meetings, we can have these crusades. Anybody been to a Billy Graham event? Anybody been to a Billy Graham event here? Okay, so some of this may, uh, you might, catch on to this, or you may not. Frontier Church, hey, they went out west. You're going to go dig for gold, right? And go out in the Wild West, all that. We've got to have somebody to go out there and, and keep those guys in line, right? So one pastor would head out to the frontier and be ministering out there in the middle of nowhere with a whole town full of people. And then a neighboring church. You know what's interesting? There was a, a way that people did church just in their own neighborhood. They would go to their neighborhood church. And there's kind of a resurgence in our, in our culture. This is a sociological thing where we want to do neighboring stuff again. right? You know how, how we've got these big doors that swallow up cars and you don't see people anymore. We don't have porches anymore. People are starting to build front porches and wanting to do things together and be neighbors like we used to be. And so that's a resurgence of that. Okay, here's one maybe some of you might connect with. Do you remember uh, evangelistic meetings where you come to the church every night? Okay, you come for a whole week. You come every service. That, anybody part of that? You ever come to those kind of services? Revival services? Revival meetings? Used to be uh, a weekend. It used to be a week. Used to be two weeks. <laughs> Let me tell you this. Used to be that the pastor would pray and get an evangelist to come. Uh, God would tell him which one he would come. And he would preach every single night until a certain number of people got saved. If they said, well, we could probably handle 12 people. You, he would preach until 12 people got saved. And then after that, they put them on the front row 
And they would disciple them. They set the, the evangelist on his way to preach to somebody else. And the church would, man, uh, they would be on them like sticky on rice. They would just be loving on them and helping them and discipling them. And then six months later, uh, they'd call up another evangelist. Time to get some more people. And that was a system. That was a way of doing church. And you you may have been a part of some of that. That's 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 come in, come went out, come in again, went out again. These are these are ways. Now I'm going to have to. Uh, okay, so maybe a church growth movement. Maybe this one is is uh, interesting. Where uh, some of you are in, were involved with church growth, where we ask ourselves, how are we going to get past these barriers? We got. We got 50 people, and we never can seem to get more than 50 people. How are we going to get over 50 people to them? 200 people. We've got to break the 250 barrier and this kind of thing, right? Anybody? Does this ring with some of you, the church growth uh, stuff that you've been through? Okay. I, I'm seeing some pastors in the room right, shake their head because they all know. We've all been through it, <laughs> right, Dwight? Uh, uh, the regional church it means, hey, we've got cars now. We don't have to just go down the block. We can, we can drive to Salina if we want to to have church. Uh, don't do that unless you're doing dinner church. Stay right here. But yeah. We've got cars, regional churches, right? Mega churches. Now it's, we've got a huge, huge mega churches and stadiums meeting. And, and it's, it's another way. And then now people are like, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do mega churches. Don't do mega churches. Let's do small churches. Let's, let's do healthy churches. Let's make sure we've got health. And we've also done those surveys. I hear you guys did it three times here. Anybody part of the natural church development while it was here? Natural Church Development Survey, uh, okay? And so uh, emerging, not emergent, emergent through the, it says there's no such thing as hell. That's, that's a heresy. But um, uh, emerging church was something else. It's very short-lived. It came up around the same time as the church health movement. And so um, it, it came and went really fast. And now I have up there incarnational and uh, contextual and fresh expressions. These are ways of us to go out and do church in communities and places outside our four walls. What's the right way? Nobody said anything yet. It's okay. Don't say it. What's the right way? I, I, here's an insight I have. I think probably the way somebody reached you with the gospel is the one that you resound with and you say, that's probably the way we should be doing church, right? Because it worked for me. That's the way I got saved. So that's probably how everybody's going to get saved. But you know, there's been decades uh, of, of people getting saved throughout these years. We've got all of this time and different ways of reaching people. And, and so we shouldn't just get stuck on one and think that that's the right answer. Um, so we have to look for ways. All right. I think I'm doing good. Now, let's talk about the big table in Friendship Center. You heard this morning that we're partnering together and we're doing this. By the way, I love the name Friendship Center. We didn't make that up. That's just the name of the community building. Okay, I, I'm going to take a few minutes because I think I have time for this. We have tried to plant churches and spent lots and lots of money on planting churches. But I'll tell you, I'm getting a little secret out of the bag. When we go to the Friendship Center, it costs us $22 an hour and we're there for two hours. $44. Now, I'm just telling you, this is one of the most efficient, inexpensive ways to plant church because um, it, it, we don't pay uh, utilities. We don't have to fix the roof. We don't have to uh, clean it. We don't have to recarpet it or any of these kind of things. All, none of, we, don't have to, we just pay the $44 to use it for the night, and we get to minister to people. And if you took that into a budget for a year... It's like, your, your church budget is what? It's amazing how much we can do. And, and I, I'm just, I think this is awesome that you guys are helping with us to do this because uh, three churches together can do a whole bunch of churches, not just one. So let's look at that for a second. On the map. Now, I want you to spy this out. I want you to see if you can find California. Can you find California? Some of you are really sharp. You can see it in Salina. There's a California. It's on the west side of Calif- uh, It's on the west side of Salina. I call it California. It's by the highway. It's south of Crawford. Are you seeing it yet? Do you see California? Do you know what California looks like? Okay. California is right there, and Nevada is right next to it. Okay. Now that's silly, 
But that, that helps you see where are we at in Salina. That's the area. That's the neighborhood. Let's take a little bit closer. The green spot is a park right there. And in that park is a building called Friendship Center. And that's where we have our dinner church. And so we're reaching out to this whole neighborhood. The, and when you look at the uh, overview, the si- satellite view of this, you'll see how many homes are in there. And these are actually small homes, smaller homes that hold um, a lot of single families and people that can walk to this building, then it's, it's, a, it's a sore neighborhood. This is a sore neighborhood. And we are going in, and they have access to some, some things they need. And the, the greatest thing of need they have is Jesus. Jesus. We're bringing the Jesus story to them, but we're feeding them before we do it. Um, there's the building. Uh, we decided not Carver Center because it's out where the... Uh, Animal shelter is. Nobody lives out there. Indian rocks way up on top of a hill, and nobody's going to go up on (laughs) there to have a meal. But we went to Friendship Center, and it's working. Now, there's some other thoughts. We've been praying and thinking about how this might grow. We can have more than one table. This is downtown Campbell Plaza. And they went downtown in Salina, and they've got those things, bars across the... This is at one of those cross sections, and uh, it's one of the little parks there. It's got park benches. Um, It is next to... Uh, I can't remember what that is. Something about a pickle. Prickly pear. It's next to the prickly pear. Yeah. And so it's got this little band shell out there. We're hoping to bring our bluegrass band. Maybe you saw it in the video. Uh, We're hoping to bring our bluegrass band to play there. They're called Color Green. Uh, Or some other musicians. Maybe you guys want to get together a group and come play while, uh, while we sit out there in the open air and eat. Another spot we're thinking might be great for a dinner church is over by Magnolia Road. Um, Schwann's and uh, Great Plains and One Vision Aviation are going into Salina in a big way, so much so that there's not enough housing for the employees that are going in for those businesses on the west side. They're going to build, uh, they're going to use $25 million and build 500 homes by the end of 2025 for those workers to live in. There's no church out there. Uh, it's just over there by those, those businesses and warehouses and we're thinking, man, is there a way we could find some way to get over there, maybe in a restaurant even, just meet in a restaurant, eat together, have a Jesus story, or some space that we could reach out to these 500 people that are moving to that community that have nowhere to go to church and are looking for some good place to connect with people. Okay. How are we doing? Oh, man, good. And I only have four minutes. Here we go. I want you to imagine... I want you to imagine that you just had a wonderful meal. You had ribs, smoked ribs, about a half a dozen of them, in fact. Man, you were a pig. (laughs) Had sweet baby Ray all over it, right? Coleslaw, maybe green beans on the side, roll. Oh, man, this is great. This is great. It's time for the Jesus story, okay? We've prayed, we've had conversation around the table, we've had fellowship, we've done all these things. We broke bread, we ate, we drank together. Now it's time for the Jesus story. This is how I do them. Ten minutes or less, you're going to be, I'll be done in ten minutes or less, okay? So don't worry. This is a second sermon, but this one doesn't take as long. I just read out of my Jesus story book that I have here, and I answer one of four questions, and I want you to know the questions because I want you to be able to discuss it later if you want to. What do I like about the story? What makes me uncomfortable about the story? What does it tell me about God? And what would I like to share of that story with somebody else? Those are the four questions. Pick one. I'll pick one once I'm done reading. And, and I, as I read, sometimes I throw in extra stuff while I'm at it, just because it's interesting. This one's in Luke 14. Listen carefully on the Sabbath. Jesus was having dinner in the home of an important religious expert. Where were they? In a home of a religious expert. What were they doing? Having dinner. Right? This happens a lot, by the way. A couple of things Jesus does a lot. He heals people and eats with sinners. All right, Jesus is there at the table and Everyone is carefully watching him. 
all of a sudden, a man with swollen legs stood up in front of him. And Jesus turned and asked the religious experts and the teachers of the law of Moses, Is it right to heal on the Sabbath? And they did not say a word. I wonder why they didn't say a word. Was it because it was on the Sabbath and they didn't want to comment on that, if you should heal on the Sabbath? Deeper, I think, have they ever healed somebody? Have they ever healed anybody? Do they have that power? Does Jesus say, you know, when you heal people, do you do it on the Sabbath? Uh, <laughs> so they, but, but they were more worried, I think, about the fact that it was a Sabbath than they don't even heal people. Hmm. So, they couldn't say a word, and Jesus took hold of the man, and this is very understated. He healed him and sent him away. There it is. That should, that should have more words. That's huge, right? It just says, he healed him and sent him away. That's an incredible miracle right there, that Jesus healed the man in his legs. And afterward, Jesus asked the people, if your son or ox falls into a well... Wouldn't you pull him out at once, even if it was on the Sabbath? And there was nothing they could say. He asked them the question that stopped their mouth immediately. You should, you should help them. Even on the Sabbath, you should do good. So, now, I'm imagining back the rest. And, you know, not everybody here is religious experts. There's a crowd of them over there trying to, you know, they're talking to each other. And here's the rest of the crowd, and they're all going. He says, I healed a man on the Sabbath. What are you going to do about it, basically, right? And they're all like, oh. They're like, oh, did you see a whoa, whoa? They're in trouble. They're in trouble over there. Here's what comes next. Catch this. Jesus saw how the guests had tried to take the best seats. So he told them, when you're invited to a wedding feast, don't sit in the best place. Someone more important may, want, may have been invited, and then the one who invited you will come up and say, give your place to another guest, and you will be embarrassed in front of everybody, and you'll sit in the worst place. And when you are invited, okay, that one right there, I'm not going to go on to the next part just yet. Oh, yeah, I do. I do need to go on. When you're invited to be a guest, go and sit in the worst place. Yeah. And then the one who is invited may come to you and say, what are you doing here? You need to be in a better seat. And then you will be honored in front of everyone and the other guests. And if you put yourself above others, you will be put down. And if you humble yourself, you'll be honored. So those that wanted to go, oh, they got in trouble. Jesus says, I have something to say to you, too. Don't go taking the best seats. Don't puff yourself up. Lower yourself and let, you, let yourself be li lifted up. Well, he's not done yet. He sa it says Jesus went to the man who had invited him. By the way, where's all this happening? At the table. These aren't three separate stories. This is at the table. You've got to picture this is happening. And he says to the man who invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet... Don't invite your friends and family and relatives and rich neighbors. If you do, they will invite you in return, and you will be paid back. When you give a feast, invite... He says, don't, don't not have the feast, right? But when you do have the feast, invite the poor, the paralyzed, the lame, the blind, and you cannot, they cannot pay you back. But God will bless you and reward you when His people rise from the dead. Now, I could go on to the next part because Jesus uh, now says a parable. He tells a story. There would be a story in the middle of our Jesus story. And what is the story Jesus tells about? A great banquet. So Jesus is at a banquet, teaching the people at the banquet how to be at a banquet. And he tells a parable about a banquet where people did not come that he wanted to come. And he says, now you're going to invite everybody. We want everybody to come to the table. This is a big table. We want everyone to come. And so in this, I guess what I have to say, the question I want to answer is, what do I like about the story? I like the fact that Jesus had something to say for everybody. He had instruction for everybody. There was nobody, the religious leaders he could have ignored, 
The other people at the table he could have ignored. He could have ignored the guest who invited him, but he had a word for everyone, a word of teaching, a, a word sometimes of correction, but a word of hope. And so in this, he says, look, I want you to go from this meal that we've had, and I want you to see that my kingdom is about inviting people to the table. Isn't it interesting that one of the big pictures we see when we get to heaven is what? It's a great banquet that we're all at. We're all getting to the banquet, right? And, and someone said, hey, uh, this eating together with each other in the name of Jesus feels like a wedding. It feels like the wedding feast. And, and I said to them, no, nah, it's just the rehearsal dinner. It's just the rehearsal dinner. I'm going to invite Pastor David to come up and close this. Um, hope that this has been good information. And I just want to say I am so thrilled that you all are in partnership with us, and we're going to do some great things in Salina. Okay? Thank you, Nick. <laughs> um, you know, part of our mission as a church is to share his love with everyone, and this is part of what we're doing. You know what the greatest need of those that are disengaged from Christ or the church it's to think again about what they thought they already knew. Because some people, the Bible tells us some people are blinded. Their, their eyes are blinded to the gospel by, by Satan himself. Others have been deceived and others have had bad experiences with religious people. They need to think again about what they thought they already knew. You know what the greatest need of people that are in church today is? To think again about what you thought you already knew. And so there are no, always new expressions. You know, we're going to be celebrating 100 years of ministry in north central Kansas this year. And here's what we know. When, what, with age, the older you get, the more you become entrenched, the more you become used to doing things a certain way, and the less you are open to change. But listen, we need new expressions. If you take a child into a nursing home, the entire place lights up because they see life, they see vitality, they see the future, they see hope. And so we need new expressions because we need to think again about what we already do. In fact, we're already doing this in many regards in various ministries. Last Thursday night, we had the CR Grill. Now, CR always has a meal, but they made a special CR grill out on the lawn and had nearly 30 people here and many guests that are there. And so we're thankful that God is doing that here in Concordia on every Thursday night. Everything that needed to be a church, it happens out at there. But we're excited about being part of that. But here's what we know. Last word for you. You can know about the big table. You can know about new expressions. You can hear about people that are disengaged from Christ in their church. You can, you can quote the statistics that you heard here that Nick shared with us and not be in relationship with people that need to have a relationship with Jesus. You can have all the information, but in order for you actually to be a part of it, you need to be engaged with it. So I want to encourage you. Here's, here, write this date down. June 20th is the next big table in Salina at the Friendship Center. You are invited to be a part of that. You show up at 530, you help set up, and then you just greet guests as they come in and you have a wonderful meal. They are lavish in the food that they have and they give take-home boxes to those that, uh, that, that want here. And here's what I found to be very uh, beneficial. Dwight Carr has gone several times and a lot of times Dwight and I will sit across the table from each other and here's what's been, what I have found to be good is to say, after the story like here, here's what I would have been thinking about it. I might ask Dwight, say, Dwight, have you ever been in a situation where you felt like you were looked down on by other people that were religious or, or something like that? And so Dwight will start sharing a story. And what happens is the people from the community of their next year, they can't wait to share their story. The most natural thing that happens when you're at it for a baby, foot, uh, not foot to mouth, <laughs> uh, hand, hand to mouth. This is what we do. They put everything in their mouth. And the guy, that's one of the most natural things that you have is hand to mouth. But when you're at the table and you ha introduce a Jesus story, pay attention to what then comes out of their mouth as they share their pain, they share their walk and things. And it's a great way to engage people with the savior of the world. So, 
be part of that. You'll get more information. June 20th, the next one. July 18th is the next one. If you can't make it in June, July 18th, there in Salina, we'll be giving information about it. Let's pray. Father, your word tells us you have prepared a table before us. In fact, Lord, I just thought of the 23rd Psalm. In, in, in the midst of our enemies, you pre- pre- present a table. And we know that there's a culture that is against the church and, and, and against ma- many things that we live and breathe and believe in. But Lord, you've prepared a table. In fact, to the church, you, Jesus, you spoke these words, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and lets me in, I will come in and have dinner with them and they with me. So Father, We want to have the heart of Jesus, and we want to sit across from the table from people that you love and that Jesus gave his life for so that they might join us at that marriage supper of the Lamb. Father, we pray that you would grab a hold of the hearts, not only here at Concordia, but at Hall Wesley and at Hutchison Wesley, and we see that you do something immeasurably more than even that we're able to ask or imagine according to the power of God that is at work within us. To you, God, be glory in the church and be glory in the dinner church for all generations, forever and ever. Amen.